Yes, okay. Um, so um, we are now going to move north into sea ice uh, infested waters. And of course, it's a bunch of Norwegians who's going to take you up there. So we are from the Nansen Center and from Norut in uh, Tromsø. And uh, the content of my presentation will first be a little bit of the background of the um, sea ice covered areas, both regarding the circulation and also some of the sea ice uh, characteristics. Then show some examples from the Doppler shift retrievals over sea ice, assess those, and come up with a summary. One thing to notice from this image that you've already seen is that uh, basically now we are no longer just seeing wind wave current coupling, but we are seeing wind wave current sea ice coupling. So we have a fourth uh, sort of uh, feature that enters into this very complicated aspects of the dynamics in this um, marginal ice zone. Well, first, let's set the background here. This is the general circulation of the Arctic Ocean. The red illustrates the warm Atlantic water and its pathway. And when it comes into the Arctic Ocean, it dives and circulates below the halocline surface layer water. The blue is the polar water that also has its characteristic being in the upper layers and being very fresh. And that illustrates its circulation. So in and out of the Fram Strait is the major uh, pathway into the Arctic Ocean and out of the Arctic Ocean. When you look at the mean dynamic topography, like uh, the one that we were able to establish from the GOES mission, that, and Marie Lang and, and Ulla Andersen and so on has been involved with as well, illustrates something remarkable comparable to this map. This map is done completely out of observations of spotted data, um, satellite, and in situ, and created this. And it illustrates it before Jaya, the transpolar drift, and the inflow of Atlantic water. In the mean dynamic topography, you find them all. This means that in the background mean ocean circulation that has to respect the mean dynamic topography, there is a very good agreement here. In other words, the ocean has a lot to say for this circulation regime here and the way the ice is moved around. Not to forget that the ice also moves around due to the wind forcing. But this is a large scale map that basically shows this. The transpolar, oops, the transpolar drift, the before gyre. Seen in this uh, map from, um, from Sersat, where the um, vectors here are 50 kilometers, and it's a three day snapshot, so meaning that it's two observations three days apart that makes this map. And it does have all these features that we saw in the previous one. So it's all done. No, it's not. Unfortunately, that is a large-scale circulation map, and we are talking orders of 25, 50 kilometer resolution. But there are some motion, again, which is more typically characterized at the mesoscale, and typically at the much less than, than 25 kilometer resolution. This is a SAR image only of a stretch of 10 kilometer. And it shows, maybe you cannot see it in the back, but it does show the the fraction of the sea ice field. This is not a homogeneous sea ice field. It's loaded with cracks and open leaves and some very flat areas and so on and so forth. From those maps, it is today possible to create the formation field. And here you see them along these uh, uh, shots here. This is from the ASA satellite, uh, and this is the ASA satellite. And what we are producing here is essentially the deformation. So this is illustrated here by the shear zone. Now we can do this over the entire winter season, and you will see that in this illustration. So this is a very dynamic thing that has a lot more motion than what you saw in that mean um, map from Sersat. This is some of the things that we need to catch up with in order to understand the dynamics of the sea ice. And um, there are models that are gradually coming towards this. This is one that is led by Pierre Baurel. <laughs> at the Nansen Center, <laughs> and it's a Lusto brittle based sea ice model. Um, but we have seen this from before, and uh, Ron Kwok was probably the first to take radar sat data and produce deformation maps. This is for a 41 day period in the winter season, and this is the divergence map, this is the vorticity map, and this is the shear map. And there is just an enormous amount of 
of indications of very fine scale features, meaning very high resolution dynamics. So in the MIS, all of this is happening as well, but in the MIS, in contrast to the central of the Arctic, it is also exposed to an open ocean on one side, where the actions from the ocean can take also forces to the field. And uh, typically things that are happening here are upwelling, mesoscale eddies, ice jets, wave refraction and attenuation, ice bands and internal waves. If you look at this map, this is what the um, Institute of Marine Research now are producing daily. It's a mixture of um, infrared passive microwave um, for the large scale, and it's blended now with Sentinel-1 at one kilometer resolution. It's automatic. It's not touched any longer by an interpreter. It's done automatically. So it shows now that we are catching up with a lot of these details that is associated with the marginal ice zone. Typically, the marginal ice zone is a, is a zone of 100 kilometers on each side of the through ice edge. So, well, uh, skim on this one. Well, we can take a further look at that because we need to look at the details. And this is an ERS-1 SAR image from the Greenland Sea again. And it shows the sea ice in the left band here, particularly you see it here. Then you see all of this black thing, which is not oil at all. It is just very slushy, thin ice that acts like uh, an oil uh, feature damping all the roughness. And outside, you see a range of things of mesoscale, sub-mesoscale variability in all shapes and forms. Three days later, ERS had this fantastic three-day repeat cycle. Three days later, the same feature, it's there. What's happened? Well, the wind regime has completely taken over. What you see now is uh, strong uh, northerly winds that blows out into the open ocean, creates this unstable atmospheric boundary layer, and forms wind streaks. And if you look at features from here to here, it is not that particularly easy to identify. So it signals one thing. The typical temporal scale of variability is in the order of a day. And we have seen that the typical spatial variability is in the order of kilometers. So we are there again, as we have been hearing a lot today. This is a photograph from a guy in an aircraft, a good friend of mine, and it was done in 1986. And it's a mesoscale eddy in the ice edge, 30 kilometers across. And the motion in this eddy, it is cyclonic. No, it is, it is, in fact, yeah, it is cyclonic. The motion inside there was 50 to 60 centimeters per second by all these pieces of ice. So you can imagine now, with the footprint we are talking about in skim, seeing this feature in the ice edge area will be hard to resolve. So it may be a mixture of the motions, and which could essentially be zero, therefore, if it is coming in with the ideal orientation versus the observations. <laughs> If we go to something like one, some recent example of waves in the ice, what you, this is from the SWARP project that was terminated in 2017. And what you see here is basically a very clear, distinct structure of the wave field as it penetrates and propagates into the ice field in the green, in the front strip. This is seven hours later. And what you see no longer is the structure of the wave field inside a typically width of 30 or so, kilo, uh, 10, 10 kilometer here. Inside there, the whole wave signal has disappeared in only six, seven hours. The reason for this is that over that time period, the wind completely changed from a long and off ice winds to on ice winds. So it basically took the entire sea ice field and packed it. And the moment you deform the ice in that way, it is immediately affecting the attenuation of the waves. So it, it's a signal of where you see waves in the ice, it is, it is probably a def deformation is more opening up, uh, diverging. Where you see no waves in the ice, it may be because it's been compacted and converged. Doppler in the sea ice field, 
uh, this is also in the Fram Strait, and this is the northern tip of Greenland here. This is the ASAR image, and this is the inverted Doppler. And what you see in the back here is a pattern recognition. There are two SAR images here. It's this one, and then the one underneath. So from that, those two images, one can do the pattern recognition, uh, the cross-correlation, and one find the optimum uh, way to track it flow from one image to the next, and hence you have the velocity. That's shown here. But this is the same now with the Doppler, completely different uh, method. And if you compare the two, they are rather well in agreement. Uh, one, one thing you notice is, of course, from the pattern recognition, you have no information in the open water. But in the Doppler, of course, there are still signals that can be considered having some sort of information also in the open water. And you see that the ice edge here is clearly visible and comparable to this one. So if we do the um, uh, correlation uh, of these two observations, you have the Doppler signal pattern recognition here and the Doppler signal here. It's a rather good agreement, particularly when you start to have enough samples inside your intercomparison. Then it sort of starts to emerge to a very nice, uh, nice uh, agreement with a slope of 1.15 and an RMS of 0.15. That's all with Anvisat, and we are waiting for this Sentinel, and with the, uh, this is the last one in this case, I can just, I think I skipped that now, because I was on to this one. So what about Sentinel-1? That's what you are all asking for, and here it is. So in the left, it is a um, radar sat image and a um, Sentinel-1 image with a few hours separation. And the um, vectors that you see on top, of the uh, um, current derived vectors from the cross-correlation method between the two SAR images. Then to the left, you see the Sentinel-1 tops signal in the amplitude signal here, in the Doppler there. And here, you have again taken out the, the cross-correlation signal into this image. And if you want to look for agreements, you start to see immediately that the color shape here and the color shape there sort of compares. Then the transition into the, to the greenish and the yellowish is all seen here. So there is apparently some uh, possibilities to derive the signals of, um, of this ice drift from, uh, from the Sentinel one. Did you, did you hear that, Bertrand? Bertrand? Did you, did you got that? There was a, this is another example of a positive retrieval of the Doppler from Sentinel. No overseers. So um, um, you can talk to Harald if you don't believe it. <laughs> okay. um, and again, the correlation here shows rather good agreements for the different SWOT uh, that has been used. Extended wide, uh, the, the third uh, SWOT, the mid, and the... And the, and the, and, um, the, the fourth SWOT, the, the fifth SWOT. So they all display that here. And yeah, the question immediately is, are that the opening up for possibilities with skim? Well, what's the incidence angle for the extended wide SWOT three compared to skim incidence angle? And again, we will have to be, be a bit um, um, careful there, jumping that immediately. But in summary, uh, the Doppler-based retrieval uh, of um, method of ASEA seems to, to, to work. Um, but it has the large incidence angles as a favorable uh, regime. And yeah, obviously, when you look steep down over ASEA, where the waves are damped, there is even less uh, motion in this direction. So to get the CIS field velocity field out, you clearly want to be further out, but with um, basically no... Uh, much of the waves anymore, but we can't get the, both of that with skim, so we are faced with this challenge. The coupling between the, the pattern recognition and this, this, the, the Doppler is something that I think can become a very powerful way to recover the two-dimensional vector, because the Doppler will only give the radial component, whereas the, the pattern recognition do the through the rift between two executive images, and hence they combine, could move this into the through vector. The spatial resolution on this will probably not be possible at scales much less than 10 kilometer. Um, the, the use of wave information in the CIS field 
may support some of the findings by, by the, the, the velocity field, the 2D velocity field, can also illustrate the formation. And one can have the wave field to some extent to support or, or assess where the, the formation field is, um, is very strong and so on. And sea ice models are ready to use this information, that's clear. And particularly the new transition onto these elastobrittle um, sea ice models, which is saying goodbye to the plastic uh, elastic viscous models, where, where those things were not so much able to distinguish leads and or to simulate leads, the elastobrittle can do that. And also for the sea ice couple sea ice ocean models, this is all very clearly uh, highly needed. Yes, that's it. But one last message. You guys have to hurry up. <laughs> and the reason for that is this. <laughs> no, but we'll be ready because we'll be there ready with the first uh, measurements in the ice free summer. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, we document yeah, we document with skim that there's no more ice in the no Arctic Ocean. Fantastic, fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Johnny. Is there are there any serious questions? Uh, yeah, one second, Rosemary. Um, how do you deal with tidal currents and in consecutive images? Well, the tidal curves will bring uh, basically an effect onto the um, pattern recognition motion as well as into the Doppler. So we don't essentially do much with it. We just have that information in there as well. We are not able to, to really partition it to say that so much of this motion is due to tides compared to an um, additional um, geostrophic or wind-driven surface uh, drift. We cannot say that. Then you have to go to independent sources of information. <laughs>